Hey everyone. This video is going to be a little bit different from what I normally do here. While I normally do a deep dive into some odd figure or issue that I find funny and connect that to some broader sociological idea like a cat proudly presenting a dead bird to its owners, in this video we're going to get serious and take a step back to tackle the real issues that we as a species face. We're going to be talking about the deceptively simple yet for that very reason all the more revolutionary text down to earth with Zac Efron. In Mark Fisher's book Capitalist Realism, he... Okay, look, I, I, I'm just gonna level with you. I took too long making my last video and I've got a couple extremely research heavy videos coming up so I thought for this month we could just relax and talk about something extremely funny and dumb. If you're here to learn about sociology and history then come back in March but for the rest of you let's all just relax a little bit by putting our brains in the microwave and hitting defrost. Just a heads up, I don't really do media criticism much, so if this turns out bad, I'm sorry. Uh, on the bright side, if I mess this up, maybe people will finally stop comparing me to left tube heartthrob Big Joel. Oh how we love our beautiful King Big Joel, you'll all cry. We're in hell is nothing but a slimy rat, you'll jeer. I'm gonna be honest, I have not been getting much sleep lately. Down to Earth is a show about Zac Efron and his friend slash I guess mentor Darren Olween traveling the world and having a great time doing fun activities, seeing beautiful places and enjoying amazing food. At the same time, they're doing all of this as a way to use Zac's massive platform to spread awareness about climate change. As I surf across what looks like an endless desert, I can't help but think about how the planet is changing. On the one hand, the show presents a prime piece of escapism, especially in a year when those fun things are impossible. It's nice for us to just relax a bit and watch these two big dumb men enjoy a world which is for the time inaccessible to us. On the other hand, the explicitly stated purpose of the show is to be a call to action for viewers to stand up and personally take actions to fight against climate change for the sake of preserving human life on Earth. There's a weird tension between these two themes. We're shown Zach and Darren interviewing a climate scientist from the London School of Economics who explains the need for bold political action to prevent climate catastrophe. The single most important thing is, I guess, is to exercise the, the political voice we have in elections to demand change. And then their next stop is to go ride the world's largest tunnel slide. Hi, Mom. <laughs> As we'll see, Down to Earth constantly presents us with these types of dichotomies which it brings together in a way that both highlights and muddies them. By the way, totally unrelated, but back when I was in university talking about muddied dichotomies was my go-to way to bullshit an English essay. You see, these two loose themes are presented as opposites, except in the cases when they aren't, which means that any holes in my argument only serve to strengthen my case. We see the same narrative tension play out again through the two hosts of the show, Zach and Darren. Again, a dichotomy is presented and then subverted as the show brings together two seemingly opposite visions of masculinity. On the one hand, we see a force of good who is tragically flawed by his own naivete manifested in the himbo. On the other hand, we see the himbo's dark inverse, the villainous grifter. Zac Efron is the main host of the show and also a massive idiot. He does honestly strike me as nice and well-intentioned, but oh man, he is not smart. He has a lot of really great dumb guy moments, which are honestly some of the best parts of the show. Like in the Costa Rica episode, a guy explains how they burn their sewage as a form of fuel, and Zac says, It looks like it burns like the Olympic torch. Yeah. 
or in Italy, they go to Sardinia, a town with an unusually high number of people over the age of 100. Zach spends a day with a 97 year old guy and is super impressed by the fact that the guy fought in World War II. He served in World War II as a pilot and later he was a shepherd. But like he fought for Italy? <laughs> they actually just spend like half an episode showing how cute this little old fascist is. If you live long enough, you end up living several different lives. Child, military man, shepherd, husband, father, grandfather, great-grandfather. While I obviously have no proof of this, I am certain that there was a point when Zach thanked him for his service and they had to cut that out in post. Oh, this sweet old man just loves the carnival. Apparently when he was young, he was involved in something called the March on Rome. Zach's himboness comes out in full force though when in a bunch of the episodes he learns about sustainability by getting a tour of like a big public works facility like a geothermal power plant or a water treatment center. The way this plays out is that the person giving them the tour will just be some civil servant who, while I'm sure they're good at whatever their actual job is, they aren't interesting. And so to compensate, the show focuses on Zach, who will either get bored. Whoa, yeah, cool. Sweet, I wonder why that's there. Yeah. Hmm, guess I'll never know. Say something weird. I'm just ready for a, a like a merman to swim up and be like, yes. Or best of all, sometimes he'll just get rowdy. Like when they go to a lab in Peru that researches potatoes, Zach watches them do an experiment with liquid nitrogen, which he doesn't really pay any attention to, but then gets them to pour the liquid nitrogen over his GoPro to see if it still works. So what's my next natural inclination? This is the GoPro liquid nitrogen test. For science. In three, two, one. There are also a few points where you wind up feeling pretty bad for Zach. He talks about how he lost a big part of his childhood by having to grow up in the public eye. Just naturally, I'm like, I feel like I'm getting dressed for a runway show every day. I was like 18, I had no and when they go to Italy and learn all about this town where people live abnormally long lives, a subject which I think is legitimately pretty interesting, Zach's big takeaway is just that it's okay to eat carbs sometimes. I'm so happy that I'm eating carbs again. <laughs> and it's like, Damn, this guy has not had any control over his life since he was like 14. While Zack is pretty naive and misguided, he is basically a force of good on the show. Darren Olean, on the other hand, is a very different animal altogether. Darren is a health and wellness expert that Zack heard on a podcast and decided to make a show with. I love the fact that they're just so open about how the show feels completely like the type of thing Zach and Darren decide to do at 7 a.m. after being out all night on coke. Anyway, Darren's one of those ripped health guys who looks like he could be anywhere between 30 and 60 years old, and he's the fucking worst. And the people that have a problem, guess what that is? They're Problem. In terms of his role as like a character on the show, I would describe Darren as a deeply malevolent presence. While Zach has plenty of faults, I'd say that he comes off as a pretty genuinely nice guy whenever he's on screen. Darren, on the other hand, while he isn't often just a straight up jerk, he's sort of a stern know it all and it's not very pleasant to watch him. My personal headcanon is that Zack is in a sort of MK Ultra Manchurian Candidate situation and Darren is his handler. I can't feel my feet or my hands. Proud of you, bro. Yeah. <laughs> Darren, just enroll me for a few semesters, please. Darren's actual deal, though, is that he's basically a health food expert slash influencer. You know, a grifter. 
Some of you may also be unfortunate enough to know him as the co-creator of Shakeology, a meal replacement protein shake that's sold by the fitness company Beachbody, which is a pyramid scheme. Weirdly, Down to Earth doesn't really talk much about Darren's scientific background as a Shakeologist. Instead, Darren's deal is that he's all about alternative healing and superfoods, which he wrote a book on called Super Life. In his book, he makes a lot of really sketchy health claims, and like, he's really shitty about it too. Organic blackberries cost double the normal kind? How does that compare to the price of chemotherapy? How does burning out your insides with toxic chemicals and destroying your immune system and puking out your guts and losing all your hair stack up against spending $3 more on that organic produce? In the show, Darren takes every opportunity to talk about how whatever they're eating is actually a superfood to a point where the term becomes completely meaningless. In fact, at one point he even gives the game away by saying that something being a superfood basically just means it's more healthy than a donut. So superfoods, Darren, is your kind of speciality, right? Yeah. What does it mean? It's really about per bite, let's call it. Having more micronutrients in them that say eating a donut would have. Okay. Right? You could technically say everything we're eating right now is superfood. It's funny because Darren's job is supposedly being a superfood hunter, meaning that he finds obscure and exotic health foods and sells them to Westerners for obscene prices. But if almost any food they eat on the show is a superfood, I don't know, it seems like we don't really need to buy Darren's incredibly overpriced Brazilian nuts. Regardless, the show really tries to sell this fiction that these two guys are best buddies on a road trip together with lots of fun scenes, them just riffing in the car. But like, these guys don't seem like friends, do they? Hey, have you met my friend Chris Kringle? <laughs> and I brought presents. <laughs> Have you seen my reindeer? Have you seen my cookies? <laughs> hey, Zach, do you want a sand surf? It's called sandboarding. Sand, sand surfing. Sandboarding. You feel like sand surfing? In the words of Owen Wilson? Wow. 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 That's really. Honestly, I can really feel for Zach here because Darren seems like the absolute worst person I could possibly imagine taking a road trip with. His vibe is kind of a combination of new age spiritual guy and bro -y jock, but in a way where he just combines the absolute worst aspects of both. In the second episode, they go to France, and once they cross the border, Darren asks them to pull over so that they can do this. It's something I like to do when I hit another country, just to feel the earth. Like, just, like, take the shoes off, feel the earth, get grounded, feel the the pulse of the earth. And so they just have to get out barefoot on the side of the road to feel the earth. A little bit later in the same episode, while they're in the car, they start talking about how Zach's able to cry on demand. He shows how he's able to do that, and then this happens. <laughs> kind of sad, isn't it? <laughs> it's kind of sad. <laughs> it's kind of well, yeah, it is. It's, uh, <laughs> it is kind of sad. I just can't imagine a worse guy to spend time with than someone who's going to force you into participating in all their obnoxious white guy spirituality bullshit, but also no homos his friend for showing emotional vulnerability. A good way to really show the difference between Zack and Darren would be to look at the pranks they pull on each other. Pranks are a good thing bros love doing to each other, right? And since these are some very normal bros, have you seen my reindeer? I'm sure it'll be great. Zach really, really loves pulling pranks, which is very funny because he's bad at them. So he'll do these really bad, poorly executed pranks and then just explode laughing in a way that's completely disproportionate to the small inconvenience he's caused.
Nice try. Happy birthday to you. To the Camu Camu gods. Oh! Oh! We got you so good! <laughs> Can't even blow out a candle. In contrast, Darren has sort of a running gag throughout the show where anytime they come across a goat, he makes Zach milk it while he stands over him menacingly and laughs. Wow. Hey. I feel like I'm milking a new thing every episode. Get it. Ooh. You're doing great. <laughs> Are we doing this? <laughs> no, I, it still feels really <laughs> weird. <laughs> and then, at one point, he literally commands Zach to drink the milk, and he does. Hey, Zach, so this is like direct out of the source, buddy. Aren't you feeling a little low on protein right now? Why? Is this your signal to drink the milk? No, I'm just saying drink the milk. <laughs> See, she likes that. Oh, man. Obviously, comedy is very subjective. I don't know if I could say that one is necessarily better than the other, but those are definitely very different kinds of pranks. Another good example of the contrast between these two visions of dumb guy would be in episode five when they go to a lab in Lima that has a walk-in freezer that's negative 20 degrees Celsius, so they have to put on winter coats when they go in. Zach bundles himself up and then jumps around a bunch freaking out about how cold it is, whereas Darren leaves the jacket open and when they leave the freezer, he says that he actually liked it in there. Wow. I like it. I'll be back in 10 minutes. <laughs> To be honest here, I'm not sure if this is actually that funny or if I've just been staring at this for too long, but this feels like such a weird flex but okay thing. Like, I live in Canada and while it's not the coldest where I live, it usually dips down to negative 20 for maybe a week every winter. I can definitely say as someone who's been a cigarette smoker, being in negative 20 for a few minutes with an open jacket isn't pleasant, but it's also not impressive. Darren saying that he liked it feels like something that like a little kid would brag about. Like it's not an accomplishment to have done that, but I also don't believe that he enjoyed it. Another really funny thing is how much product placement there is in the show. In literally every single shot, everything Zach is wearing is RVCA. The best part is that they do things that you should obviously not be wearing skater clothes for. In the last episode, they hike through ankle deep water in the Amazon rainforest and Zach looks so uncomfortable. There's also funny stuff like how whenever they plan what they're going to do, there's a shot of Darren using his phone to book the activities on TripAdvisor or they'll act like they're experiencing all these exotic traditional customs, but are just incredibly clearly staying at Hilton hotels. Apparently, I'm not a Viking until I do a fire and ice massage back at the hotel. If you want to be a real Icelandic Viking, you have to go in here into the cold tub, and then you can go a little bit into the hot one. There's also just so much pseudoscience in it. Again, we see muddy dichotomies at work where the way they'll bring up all their bullshit claims will be by first explaining some extremely basic pop science fact and then following that up with a pseudoscience claim as if it naturally follows. You gotta get the electromagnetic connection to the earth again to help your uh circadian rhythm. Well, it turns out the circadian rhythm really is a thing. It's basically your internal clock. And one more thing, water in motion produces negative ions, which are known to relieve stress, reduce tension, fight depression, and increase energy. They also do this by talking to a mix of actual experts and then also just 
Darren's grifter friends as if they're equally credible. Like, they'll talk to scientists and experts in their field, and then also a beekeeper who thinks GMOs kill bees, and a British influencer who claims going vegan cured all her diseases. The second episode is all about Zack and Darren learning that actually water is really important. And so they talk to the deputy mayor of Paris who blows their fucking minds by telling them that public drinking fountains exist. Actually in France, the idea is that everybody, you, uh, tourists coming in Paris can have free water in the streets, but also homeless people. So no one goes without clean water. Which like, that's a good message, I guess, but then they also talk to a water sommelier who looks exactly like how I pictured a water sommelier. That's right. Martin Rees is a water sommelier. He says a bunch of dumb stuff about how water with high mineral content is medicine, which it isn't. This is like considered a healing water in Germany. So this has so many minerals dissolved that Holy this actually has an cow. impact on your body now. And then he also says that drinking filtered water is bad for you because the water will go looking for nutrients and suck them out of your body, which is very much not true. Calcium, magnesium, potassium, silica, all these amazing minerals what your body actually needs. When you would drink pure water, water will look for minerals and it will find minerals in your body. So that means it pulls out of the body and you're losing extra minerals by drinking water. Uh, it is a real thing that drinking distilled water, which doesn't have any minerals in it, can be bad for you if you aren't getting those minerals from other food. But like, this guy's saying this to convince people not to trust tap water. Also, this scene is weird. He gets them to try a bunch of different expensive imported bottles of water and at one point says that the specific water is really rare and Zach is like really excited by that. And this is a water nobody else can access us in America. You That's my favorite. Thing. So you There's also a funny moment in the Italy episode where a researcher talks a bunch about how harmful fad diets and ignorant influencers are. And the whole time he's talking, Darren is just looking at him like he's going to murder the guy. Because now anybody, uh, you know, can have 20 million followers and, you know, give him some crazy idea. But you'd be surprised how many of your colleagues. <laughs> I know how many of my, I'm not have, surprised. Uh, don't have that, that well, view. I really appreciate it. The next step is to prove that there is a genetic I don't know, it just feels like if the purpose of the show is to get people to understand the reality of climate change, they maybe shouldn't have spent so much time talking to the types of people who look like they sell crystals and claim that they cure cancer. Which is obviously ridiculous. Everyone knows blackberries cure cancer. Oh yeah. Yo, honestly, water is life. Now, I'm going to dive into some of the ways that the show is problematic, but I should also say that I always want my videos to be somewhat accessible for people who don't necessarily agree with me, and whenever I talk about this stuff, I always hear a conservative troll in my head criticizing me for being too woke or whatever. I'm not too worried about that here though, because A, fuck them, and B, this show is fucking awful, and there's nothing funnier I can think of than some conservative loser getting pissed and then walking around barefoot or joining a pyramid scheme to own the libs. If a bunch of trolls wind up becoming diehard, down-to-earth fans to spite me, I'm gonna count that as a win. It's kind of like how when everyone started talking about how white people with dreadlocks should stop doing that, and a bunch of conservatives had to pretend that those people are actually really cool. Just like, yeah, I actually love the fact that you can smell them from miles away and they're constantly mooching other people's weed. That's actually cool as hell. So with that out of the way, let's get into it. Down to Earth has a really weird way of exoticizing anywhere they go that's not in America. Every time they introduce a new place, they describe it as like in the middle of nowhere in Europe. We're on a small Nordic island. We're deep in the jungles of Central America. To this European island, we're gonna visit a small island in the Caribbean. 
We're somewhere in Europe. We're in Europe. In a highly populated area. Even though they're like half an hour outside of Paris, it feels like they're trying to do Orientalism but failing because they're too dumb. This comes out most clearly in how Down to Earth handles its episodes in Latin America. Now, Latin American politics are often pretty complicated and are rarely discussed correctly, even in more competent American TV shows. And so, naturally, I had some concerns about how the two dumbest men alive would handle these sensitive issues. The way they did handle it was by literally never speaking to anyone who wasn't American. When they go to Costa Rica in episode 3, their guide is a guy named Stephen Brooks, an American expat who runs a hippie resort called Punta Mona and teaches classes on permaculture through his school Ecoversity, which he claims brings the youth to Costa Rica. Brooks' background is that after graduating college, he inherited $38,000 from his grandfather and used it to buy a ton of land in Costa Rica, which he now lives on. He then started his resort and school with some more money that he received from his parents. I learned all of this from an article on a website called TrustCouncil.com, which is a company that helps people set up trust funds. In the article, they use Brooks as an example of why giving your kids their inheritance before you die, as his parents did, can allow them to invest it better. When Zach and Darren first meet Brooks, he gets them to try freshly picked cacao seeds, which are used to make chocolate. And when they eat it, Brooks goes on a rant about how most people are so disconnected, they don't have any understanding of the actual ingredients that go into their chocolate. Isn't it amazing that chocolate is like the most sacred thing and like everybody's loving chocolate, but most people have never even seen where it comes from. Right. People are just disconnected. You disconnected. Know? How are we that disconnected though that you don't know that chocolate is this? It's like true, but also most cacao isn't picked from a tree in a rich guy's garden. It's farmed by people, sometimes children, who are paid next to nothing. Well, next to nothing in money. Obviously, they are rewarded handsomely with a feeling of deep connection to the ingredients that go into chocolate. Brooks then takes them on a tour of his beautiful home, takes them to a school for the children of expats, and then to his resort. The resort is only accessible by boat, and while they ride over, Brooks talks about how he originally decided to move to Costa Rica to help the locals learn to farm more sustainably. I wanted to see if there was a better way to, to do things. You know, all it is is design. Like the banana plantations are just unfair design. It's unfair to the people. It's unfair to the earth. It's unfair to the wildlife. As he says this, the camera pans over the Costa Ricans operating the boat, who are the only non-white people we see for the entire episode. There's also this very weird moment where the hippies from the resort come out to meet them on the beach, and at first Zach thinks they're a bunch of girls, but then realizes that some of them are guys with long hair, and that makes him actually uncomfortable. Open that, that's gonna happen. A bunch of girls coming out. There's like a bunch of chicks just walking out. Oh, some of them are long-haired guys though. What's going on? <laughs> S.O.S. Lastly, they visit a wildlife sanctuary who, you know, are doing important work, as Zach says. As more of this untouched jungle is destroyed by man, the indigenous wildlife is greatly displaced and harmed. Worth noting, though, that indigenous people have also been harmed by deforestation. And in fact, in recent years, several indigenous activists have been killed by settler farmers over land disputes. So. You know, maybe we can give them a bit of a cinema sin there for uh, never once interacting with a single person who was actually born in the country they're learning about. The second fucked up depiction of Latin America is in the last episode where they go to Peru. The episode straight up opens with a joke that Zach is going to get eaten by cannibals. Although considered repulsive and taboo by most societies, Okay. Human cannibalism still remains a common practice in a few parts of the world. Luckily, this episode has nothing to do with cannibalism. Which, I mean, isn't a great joke to make when you're an outsider getting to experience indigenous religious rituals. 
But hey, you know, comedy is all about pushing boundaries, and frankly, I think it's about time someone knocked indigenous Peruvian shamans off their silver pedestal. <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ. The first part of the episode is Darren and Zach going into the rainforest to forage for superfoods. Just like in Costa Rica, the guy showing them around is a white American expat and all the people working for him and operating the boat are not. There's a really fucked up part where Zach says how out on the Amazon River there's no signs of civilization. Just as the camera pans over a bunch of people's houses. We've left any semblance of civilization. Here on the Amazon River, we're surrounded by nature as far as the eye can see. The parts where they go foraging for superfoods aren't really interesting, but it is very funny how unbelievably stoked Darren gets over some camu camu berries. Woo! <laughs> camu camu! Woo! Ignore the crazy white guy. This is like the first kill, Zach. Mm. Like, he's so giddy to be in his element and no one else seems to care. So this is a super resin. Cuts, burns, scrapes, lesions. No. Well, you can eat it. Wow, I wish I had this when I typically have lesions. I never know what to put on my lesions. Yeah. You really get the feeling that by this point, everyone on the crew is pretty fucking sick of Darren. It's too valuable. I'm gonna... No. I don't trust your catch. Lastly, they go to an ayahuasca clinic run by, you guessed it, an American white guy. And I just want you to close your eyes for a second and picture what you think a white guy running an ayahuasca clinic looks like. It was this guy, right? And admittedly, the guy does seem like a pretty sweet person. Uh, I was in a bad way. I was a heroin addict. I was pretty much spiraling down. Came down, drank ayahuasca five times with a, with a shaman and never did heroin again. But not only that, like realized the roots of why I wanted to do heroin. The shaman said, you know, you have the potential to be a healer and this is your path. And if you want, you can come down and live with me and I'll teach you. But also, maybe they could have shown his mentor in the show instead of just guy who looks like he got banned from our radio head and then docks the moderators. Zach also mentions how ayahuasca has become a major source of tourism for Peru. Ayahuasca tourism is a huge thing. People come from all over the world to get special rainforest treatments from camps in the Amazon jungle like this one. But doesn't go into how increased demand from tourists has actually led to shortages of ayahuasca for indigenous people who need it for traditional religious rituals. So ultimately, where does this leave us? A lot of critical pieces I've seen about Down to Earth cut the show some slack for ultimately being well-intentioned since they are trying to raise awareness about climate change. But I got news for you. I'm not, baby. I'm coming for you, Efron. The mad dog is off the leash. I think that what's so striking about how the show talks about fighting climate change isn't just that it views it as a personal responsibility and not a matter of systemic change. While that's obviously bad, Down to Earth definitely isn't unique there. What stands out to me about Down to Earth is how the show weirdly doesn't even tell people to do little things like taking the bus, recycling, or consuming less. Instead, just like how Darren's health advice centers around buying overpriced blackberries or leveraging your mortgage to sell protein shakes, Down to Earth's call to action is all about fighting climate change by consuming expensive products. Ultimately, fighting climate change stops being a tangible political struggle and becomes commodified into a component of a luxury lifestyle. It kind of reminds me of when notorious Canadian dark himbo Justin Trudeau showed up to march at a climate change protest. The fact that the most powerful person in my country could show up and join in chanting for systemic change shows how that had stopped being a call for radical political goals, but instead had become something more akin to a wistful prayer.
By the way, I'm quoting Frederick Jameson there. I still have not read Capitalist Realism. Hey everyone, thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed our little detour into the world of himbodom. This was a lot of fun to do. Normally, my videos have a bit higher production value and a lot more research, and I'll be getting back to that next month, but this was a lot of fun. Big thank yous to Jose for lending me his beautiful voice, and to Chill Goblin for helping me out with the script. And a big, big, big thank you to all of my wonderful patrons who allow me to do this instead of having a real job. And uh, if you want that for me too, uh, consider becoming a patron. A lot of cool people have done that, so maybe you should too. Especially Christopher Tubbs, Jasmine Wellner, Eric Walker, Bean the Ruse, Isaac Slatten, Hannah Gaiacommon Rose, Beth Solman, Comrade Fox, Royal Road, Weapon X Reject, Macubus Gubus, Rachel Ann, Megan Glynn, Sarcasm Jaime, Georgia Three, Niels Abelgard, Charles Akawa, Buzzkiller, O Death, Heather Boning, Dr. Thembo69, Thighs and French Fries, Daniel Jocelyn, Slithers, J. Fraser Cartwright, Mosh Zombie, Ramsey Bargudi, Caleb F. Fails, Alec J. Radecki, Marina Dove, H. Johnson, Bill Nibs, Julia Soares, Cameron Hussein, Becca B, Just Ono, oh Evan, Cody Stevens, Tony Wise, Morgan, Sean McIntyre, Max Gorenson, Alfonso, Jacob Friedman, Graydon Sims, G. Purr, Casey Kutniak, Jubion, Nick Corpius, Ruby, Jamie, Baron Golgrita Af Crystal Krona, Kenzie G, Clement Chutskoff, Arnez Calling, Kells, Julian, What's Therapy, Alistair Butler, Roderick Plass, Retro and Chill, Caitlin Hunt, Eric Prochnow, Miguel Crespo, Contot, Kevin Ritter, Mackenzie Lyre, The Magpie Magus, Emma Ney, Tyler Ulrich, Trenton Coleman, Phil Argeria, Rob Rory, Max Elford, Shiloh Sojourner Sachs, Thomas Brereton, Maddie G, Sif, Maurice Robert, Anis23, Gamp, Relaxo, Tim Hoffsummer, Nemo, Comrade Sai, Isso Kuhn, Mitch Kennedy, Glitter Trash, E.H. Sawyer, Lucas Mulhall, Rioting Pacifist, Trucks Young, Cafe Softy, Bruni, Red, Eric Pedden, Russell Gilchrist, Kanika, Dylan Robinson, Benick G. Spicer, The Silver Samaritan, Simon, Carrie M., Thomas Swords, Alexandra Fails, Kristen, Subsystem of Society, Communist Android, Christina Davis, QTA 10, Ron Doofdad, Jack Crawford, Judd from Splatoon, Lonely Party, Eggs Boss, Kennedy, Loaline, Christian Balhuis, Muppet Mistake. Good Poon hates cops, that solid Poon then. Thank you all so, so much for watching, and peace out.